was raised in the Mormon church. We grew up always told that you'll follow exactly what your church leaders teach. And if you don't do it, that you could lose everything. Cool, Saint President Hinckley. In church, we joined scouts when we were eight. Scouting was treated like the church back then. Church talks a lot about following the Holy Ghost, the spirit of peace that guides you in your life. Any kind of contention as often looked at is not the spirit of the Holy Ghost. I've always protected my church, but it hasn't done me any favors not to expose everything that I know. I was interested in journalism, I think, before I knew what journalism was. In maybe first or second grade, you know, we were all debating, you know, is the Tooth Fairy real, is Santa real? We wanted to know, is that true? So I started setting up traps. Around the chimney, I set up trip wires and cameras and all this stuff to try to catch Santa. And with the Tooth Fairy, I did the same thing in my bedroom. Well, that was kind of my first foray into journalism. After college, I did a fellowship, and the main teacher there said, Peter, I know this sounds crazy, but you need to consider applying for this job at this paper called the Post Register. And I looked into it, and I thought it was a terrible idea. The Post Register is a small paper in eastern Idaho. It was a small conservative town that had a large Mormon population. It really wasn't the most LGBT-friendly place I could imagine. But I heard they had a great editor, Dean Miller. The newspaper's role there is sometimes whipping boy because the paper had a long tradition of challenging authority. And yet, the paper was really devoted to local news, and so there was a good amount of loyalty in the community to the paper because we were the local institution that really focused on the good of the community. I really love the work. I mean, I just worked all the time. I've always been somebody who liked to ask questions and figure out what was really going on and try to determine what the truth is. I got this uh, anonymous tip about a missing court case. I mean, in a pretty dramatic way, I ended up having to meet somebody late at night uh, to get the tip, and it was a sticky note with a case number on it. So I went to the courthouse, and they had these computers. I typed in the case number, and up on the screen came something I'd never seen before, which was, I think it said, case not found. And I was thinking, what does that mean? So I looked up the cases before it, and I could see them, and I looked up the cases after it, and I could see them, but then there was this one case that was just there was just nothing there. That was the beginning of the saga. The computer system didn't even have a record that the case existed, which is a little bit troubling. So this was, you know, setting off alarms. And so we started pushing. We went after the court system to say, well, wait a minute. And you can't just make cases disappear. There has to be some record that they existed. And we were getting leaked materials from the file, letting us know what was in there. We learned a lot about Brad Stoll. Brad Stoll was a new name to me. He was a pedophile. When we got into the court file, finally, there were dozens of victims. This was a serial pedophile. Digging into the file, you realize that he was doing this at scout camp. I met a guy at church who, his name was Brad Stoles. He was 24, and he became like my best friend. I was like 13 or 14. 
I was an easy target. I probably wasn't as good at making friends in junior high. I was still growing up, getting comfortable in my skin and stuff. He was also becoming a seminary teacher for the LDS church, and I just trusted him. And then um, he invited us to work at scout camp. And before the season started, he took me up there, just myself. I remember that night, you know, I slept next to him. And I remember waking up at night, and he was, like, leaning over me and stuff. And I woke up later, um, and all my fly, my clothes were all undone. My pants were pulled down and stuff. And he was, like, totally asleep. And he, he was in a sleeping bag next to me, and, he, and all of his clothes were, like, not in his sleeping bag. I remember that was, like, the first time where I was just kind of confused, but I still didn't, like, make sense of what was going on. Right now, we're going uh, to Camp Little Lemhi, where the sexual abuse happened to me from Brad Stalls, and I haven't been back here since it happened. I'm having a much more visceral response in my body <laughs> than I expected. Like, I, I feel my adrenaline going right now. Feel like this giant pile of snow we gotta climb through to get in. It's like the pile of shit I've been trying to climb to get out. This place is just, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I hate, I hate what happened here. But I don't wanna be scared of this place. Hi. I remember him getting so angry and so threatening. And this, he was over by this obstacle course, walking super fast, going between the trees, coming out, going all over the place. He held me down and put his hands uh, in my anus. I was like, just groping me and stuff, and I couldn't even move. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. He'd give me his massage as I went to sleep, and then I was just his toy. He was violent, uh, angry, um, when he didn't get what he wanted. I was sexually abused in that cabin right there. Brad Stills slept right next to me on the mattress and the main floor. Yeah, right, right on the other side of that window that's boarded out was where there was the bed. In church, we joined scouts when we were eight. It was really cool. I, I, I love so much the campouts. Adventure, tons of campouts, animals outside. Tons of fun with your friends, your buddies. And I just, you know, I didn't expect being scared to death that the guy next to you isn't going to sleep. And you don't know why he's not going to sleep and his clothes are like coming off. And he's way bigger than you and then he's pressed on, on your body and he starts masturbating your body with his body and starts touching you and doing all these things that you were gonna save your whole life for, for your dream. And it's happening by this crazy, crazy, horrible man. I can't think how in the world like a big person could think so selfishly to just 
I mean, to do this to a child is just beyond, like, beyond any comprehension. I hate that place. Adam is at first, as a young boy is in that situation, horrified and, you know, feeling guilty and did I do something wrong? And pretty quickly finds his moral compass. It's an extraordinary moral compass. Adam goes to the camp leadership and says, hey, Brad is molesting kids at camp. Camp leadership brushes him off. And he says, OK, they're going to take care of it. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Just go back to everything. Everything's normal. But nobody went to stop Brad. I came back to him and said, this is not working. You have to do something. You have to do something. Finally, I asked to talk to his supervisor. So they put me on the phone with this guy I've never met. I'm like, what's his name? And they're like, oh, this is Kim Hansen. So I'm on the phone with Kim Hansen, and I'm telling him what's happening. And Kim Hansen's like, oh, that's horrible. Th that's horrible what's happening. But we don't want anybody to know about it. If people know about it, nobody will come back to scout camp, and you'll ruin it for everybody. No one will ever come here anymore. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. That's what's next thing. He said, you got to promise me you won't tell your parents. You won't tell anyone. We're going to take care of this. We'll be the ones that take care of it. And that's what he told me. And Brad was still sexually abusing kids up here. And I said, this does not work. And I said, I'm calling the police. And I called the police. The day that the police arrested him, he confessed to 24 victims and others. He didn't even remember their names. That should have been like the end of the story, where the good guys came in and fixed it. But that, unfortunately, was just the beginning. When we met Adam, he was having a really hard time. And yet, with his dad, they sat down and said, we're going to tell this story. It was just one of those stories where the more you reported it, the more you were just taken aback by what, what was in the story. It's a case where secrecy was toxic. That first step of realizing it exists and stopping to ignore it was absolutely crucial. It ended up being something way bigger than I think anyone could have imagined at the time. We found in the file, for instance, the fact that there were people in the scouting organization who knew Certain kids had been molested by Brad Stoll, and they never told those kids' parents. And, you know, the lawyer justifying not telling the parents, saying, well, the kids probably don't remember what happened, and if they did, it's best left alone. In the same area, sexual abuse in the school system, someone goes for like 25 years, but in the scouting system where everybody's LDS, Mormon, they're sending pedophiles to bishops. And if the bishop interviews them and they're okay, he sends them to back to scout camp to work. Brad Stoll's actually had gone through the legal system for pedophilia and they knew it. And they sent him to a bishop to see if he was okay and sent him out there to work. The bishop said he's fine. Yeah. The Mormon Church and the Boy Scouts of America go back together almost to the beginning. I think the Mormon Church adopted scouting as its exclusive youth program back in the 1920s. Mormons are taught that the doctrine of repentance and forgiveness is absolute and that if an individual has repented of his sin uh, to a bishop 
and the bishop is satisfied that it's sincere, then under church teachings, that individual must be forgiven. And church lawyers have argued this, that cleansed the individual of his sins, and he was a new person, and he must be restored to the position he was in. The Mormon Church instructs its members from childhood on that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And whatever the problem is that you may have, you keep it within the Mormon family. Especially in the Mormon community, you see a backlash against individuals who come forward and disclose. The scouting I grew up in, you know, the classic thing would have been for all those boys to sort of embrace Adam and say, you stood up to a monster and you protected us and other kids. That didn't happen. This is where I was going to school when I, when I first met uh, Brad Stoles. I remember getting hit against this wall and knocked down. Uh, there were some really big guys on the football team that were hitting me. They were all calling me a fag. And this was right after the media, the news came out about Brad Stoles being arrested for sexual child abuse at scout camp. From that day forward, all of my friend relationships just started getting more distant. I mean, by the time I reached high school, just like two years later, it's like, it's like I didn't have friends anymore. There's this pattern in which the community is in denial, and the first place they go is to attack the messenger. in the sort of upper power echelons of the community. It was like, who is this newspaper to be airing our dirty laundry? You know, it's none of their business. So there was a lot of anger about that and a and, um, certain amount of embarrassment and, and uh, certainly there's, uh, that's as far as I should go. Can I just say, I'm reluctant to talk about one of the critics in particular because a billion dollars is an extraordinary amount of money. That's a small nation amount of money. Frank Vandersloot is a self-made billionaire who built up a very successful company called Melaleuca that sells supplements He's a very big presence in, in Idaho Falls. The local minor league ballpark is named after the company, and he's the richest man in town. Vandersloot had been active against same-sex marriage. He's also involved with the Mormon Church and the Boy Scouts, and so when this series appears by Peter Zuckerman in the local paper, he takes umbrage. He takes it upon himself to published newspaper ads, full-page ads, in that same paper that ran the investigation, going after the investigation, presenting his point of view, and eventually going after Peter Zuckerman himself. It basically said this reporting was terrible, it was biased, and some people have said that Peter Zuckerman's sexual orientation has something to do with him not being objective on this issue. And it says that would be wrong to say. He gets people knocking on his door late at night. People in his church are surprised. And it's a very different experience for him being out to a small number of people versus it being in print for every reader of the newspaper. There was a, a full page ad that came out in the local paper. What happened and how did it, how did it affect you? I am not gonna comment on that or you know, way into that debate. Okay. Why not? No. I'm just not going to. Okay. To go after the biography of someone who is working on a story is out of bounds, unethical. You can argue whether the story is right or wrong, fair or unfair, um, but once 
somebody starts attacking your standing to tell the story in the first place, you're not able to challenge the story on its merits. I mean, it's sort of the last bastion. It's, an, it's a logical fallacy. I looked at this, I saw there's some uh, some things that didn't seem right to me. I wanted to find out. I hired a, a legal team, because it's all in the court documents. I'm not sure I would understand them all. I hired them to go find out if this was, wh what the post register was saying was true or not true. They came back saying, it's amazing. The story doesn't fit what the facts of the case are at all. That's what uh, your and then I said thought to you. Lines okay. throughout you can this bad mouth the paper that. all you want, but it doesn't change the truth. Brad Stoll did these things. People who I agree knew with that. People who knew or should have suspected that he had a problem because he had confessed what he had done to them made the decision not to share that information. I can totally sympathize with your wish that this stuff was not true. I'm a scout from a long line of scouts. I know how terrible this story is. But the fact is, this story stands on sworn statements. And I believe the people who took their oath, and I believe the Boy Scouts, such as Adam Steed, who came forward to tell the story. And you're saying things in here that are entirely not true. They're not supported by fact. They're not supported by testimony. You, that, they well, did know. That is no, your let opinion. me finish. Because if people read the file, it is supported in the file. This was an extremely controversial piece of reporting, and we never had a correction. We never had a request for a correction from anybody involved in the story. Communities do not deal well with being called to account in this way. It was really hard when um, people started leaving notes on my doorstep, when somebody kept calling in the middle of the night threatening to rape me with his handgun. Um, it was, I mean, that was really terrible. And then um, professionally, it became much harder to do my job. Um, because, yeah, Idaho Falls was buzzing about my sexual orientation. And, you know, when I tried to talk to people they would, who were on my beat, they would say things like, oh, well, I can't talk to you. You're homosexual. Peter Zuckerman was deposed, I think, for 10 hours, give or take, um, with Frank van der Sloot attending. Could you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. What happened after the articles or the advertisements were run that were it was different than what had happened before? So objection ambiguous. I mean, it was awful. Um, I mean, it was, it, was, it was one of the darkest periods of my life. It was... I mean, what, what happened is what I described happened. Sorry, it's just... I don't even like to think about it. Jesus. Do you want to take a break? Yeah. <laughs> Put the record, please.
And my colleague Jason Felch and I got interested in issue through a particular case of a scout leader who had been a sexual abuser both in the United States and Canada. And from that, we launched into a look at the Boy Scouts ineligible volunteer files, which also are known as the perversion files. They were all of the same format. They would have information on scout leaders, volunteers who had been caught abusing kids and excluded from the scouts. This kind of abuse occurred across the country and in all walks of life, and it occurred everywhere in all 50 states. We found over 100 cases where sexual abusers had been excluded from the scouts and then gotten back in either by just moving to another troop, another area, or in some cases, when they were excluded, the scouts had just kind of said, go away, we won't tell anybody about this. Uh, this is just between us. Many times the scouts would find blatantly criminal behavior involving these guys and would not report them to the authorities. They would just kind of kick them out. And sometimes we're as overt as saying, this reflects badly on the Boy Scouts. We don't need this to get out into the public view. You're saying they've made a choice to protect their own image over protecting kids. Right. I found out that there was another guy named Jeff Bird, who was another uh, victim of sexual abuse. 24 years before me, and that Kim Hansen also quieted him down while Kim Hansen was over that scout camp, too. 1983, I was at Island Park Scout Camp. I stayed the weekend. Um, it was just me and a, another staffer. We were the only people in the whole camp. And so over that weekend is when everything happened. Dennis was uh, an adult. Dennis. Mm -hmm, that uh, took an interest in me. And he wanted me to move into the same tent with him. It's the same thing that happened for me with Brad Stalls. He had weapons, had a 44, and he scared me. Can I use some specific language? You won't feel shamed. Did, did that guy, did, did he rape you? Yes. Like, forcefully? Yes. I felt ashamed. I didn't understand my role. It was a secret, and I knew that it was something that I didn't want and it was wrong. Part of the shame that I carry is when I was 19, I found out that Dennis was in Utah and had been arrested, and that he had done the same thing down there with a weapon, except with younger children, that he'd been with the scouting program. I wanted to contact the post register and contact you, and, uh, See what I can do to help. It's kind of an atonement for my ineffectiveness of years past. You feel like it's your fault that it wasn't changed before it happened to me? Jeff, it's not your fault. Come here, buddy. Hey, that was a horrible, horrible thing that happened to me and a horrible, horrible thing that happened to you and it had nothing to do with either one of us. I know, I was just a kid, but I tried to, to deal with it at the time. And then I tried again later and years after that, in which I found out about your experience dealing with the same people. They still say that we make these stories up. They still think it's fake. 
because it's easier to hide it than to face it. And if we talk about it, and we face it. Yeah. The Boy Scouts say they've taken steps to stop this problem, that since the early 90s they've made sure that scout leaders go through a criminal background check. What First of all, they, they fought criminal background checks. But the more important point is that criminal background checks are meaningless, because most of these people have never been arrested before. They have no criminal background. Can scouting ever be made reasonably safe? My answer is no, it can't. So it has to go away. It has to go away. It has to, it has to be burnt to the ground. They have forfeited their moral right to this privilege that, that was granted by the American people. They're hiding from the truth, and they're trying to hide that truth from the American public. This is a letter of apology that Brad Stoltz wrote me, and I've never read it. You are not to blame in any part of this, Adam. Sad when a pedophile says what the church never said. <laughs>